Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Resurrection Evangelical Lutheran Church. Welcome to any of those who may be joining us online as well. Today, our theme is the resurrection produces comfort for the dying. So that even as we look out the window and see this time of year, the nature begins to die. Inwardly, the church is renewed by the hope of the life of the world to come. We begin our worship this morning with our opening hymn. Please join with me in singing 881. Sing with all the saints in glory. May God bless our worship this morning. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, 
For the well-being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
Bible, Revelation chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Amen. The text for our consideration this morning is Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. The text reads, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. The word of the Lord. Dear saints of God, I want to paint a scene for you with words. And as I do, I want you to ask yourself, does this scene sound familiar? Is it something you can relate to? An old man sits at his desk with his head in his hands. He's not allowed to go outside to see the outside world and visit his loved ones, but he's stuck inside. And there is a non-stop stream of bad news coming in from the outside world. And it doesn't look good for the church either. The older generation of strong and faithful leaders is all but gone. And churches today are cold, apathetic. Many have given up on the word of God altogether. And as he sits there, the old man can't help but wonder, why am I still here? What's the point? The whole world is falling apart. Does that sound familiar? But the scene I'm painting for you is not circa 2020 AD. Rather, 95 AD. The Apostle John was exiled to the island of Patmos, and there he was not allowed to leave. And he had heard the news. His fellow apostles were martyred one by one by one until John's the last one left. And where he had once seen the church so young and full of life and vibrant, for example, on Pentecost, when 3,000 were baptized in a single day, now John writes to churches like the Laodiceans, lukewarm Christians, not really interested in spiritual things, just want their material wealth to buy a few more toys. And it's in that moment, when it seems pointless or hopeless, that Jesus appears to John, and in Revelation, Jesus pulls back the curtain to make this message clear to John, to you, to me, to the whole church. Jesus gets the last word. No matter what happens, Jesus gets the last word. Just before the verses I read for you, John records the vision of Judgment Day, when Jesus gets the last word as judge. And the first defendant to take the stand might seem a little harmless at first. After all, it's just a little garden snake who told a woman to eat a piece of fruit and eat it. 
Though the snake did not bite her with venom, his words poisoned her. With four words did God really say, Satan poured poison into Adam and Eve and all their descendants and doomed us to spiritual death, separation from God. And the blood on the hands of Hitler or Stalin cannot compare to this act of violence. All died in sin. Revelation rightly calls Satan the great and murderous dragon. Jesus rightly says that he was a murderer from the beginning. But Jesus was not going to let a murderer get the last word. And so on the cross, as the Son of God bled and died, the four words of Satan, did God really say, were undone by three words. It is finished. And to set the record straight, just in case anyone would have gotten it wrong, to proclaim victory over death, the empty tomb declares victory with three words as well. He is risen. So now, at the last judgment, Jesus gets the last word about Satan. And as we sang a few weeks ago for Reformation, one little word can fell him, and that word is liar. And with that word, he's judged, the deed is done, and Jesus cast Satan into the lake of fire, and death with him, never to deceive or tempt or accuse God's children ever again. Satan and death cannot harm us. With Satan and death judged, all of humanity takes the stand. And the books are opened. The books that record every thought, word, and deed. And each is judged according to their deeds. And about that judgment, John writes, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. For a moment, we might tremble. Cowardice? Doubt? I'm not perfect. Does that mean I'm going to the lake of fire? If it's all liars, I've told a lie before. But another book was opened, the book of life. And dear Christian, you and I find our names engraved in the book of life. And the ink with which our names are written is the blood of Jesus. And that blood, that ink pours over into the other books so that all of our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. And all that is left is the record of good works we have done in faith and the perfect life of Jesus himself. Jesus gets the last word about us, too. Not guilty. So where do we go? If everyone else went to the lake of burning sulfur, what about us? That's where these verses begin. John sees a new heaven and a new earth, and with it a new Jerusalem descending from heaven, personally prepared by God himself, more beautiful than anything you've ever seen before. And I can only imagine that as John sees that beautiful city descend, tears well up in his eyes, because John knows. He knows the old Jerusalem. He remembers. He was there. But he also heard the news. It was destroyed by the Romans about 20 years ago. And to understand what it would be like for John to see that new Jerusalem, I want us to consider something 20 years ago in our own history. 
How many of you can remember 9-11? Where you were, what you saw, what you felt? Take that feeling and mentally go to ground zero. See the ruins before you. And imagine them being swept into the wind and down from the sky floats down new Twin Towers. And inside of them are all the lives that were extinguished that day. That's what it's like when John sees the new Jerusalem. But it's even better than that. Jerusalem was a good city. But now, as we'll sing at the end of the service, Jerusalem is golden. God's name was always meant to dwell in Jerusalem. And that's where the Jews would direct their prayers. They would face Jerusalem. Because that's where the worship and the sacrifices happened. If you were in the city, you could go to the temple to be near the presence of God. But you could only come so far. Because if you came too close, for example, to the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, too holy, too perfect and righteous for you, would strike you dead in that moment. But that was the old Jerusalem. This is the new Jerusalem. And in the new Jerusalem, you walk down the street and see God as plain as day. And you can go up to him face to face. And like Thomas, you can touch the nail marks at his side. Like Mary Magdalene, you can cling to his feet. And Jesus isn't there just like a mall Santa to look good for the pictures and get a little grumpy with the children. No, he's happy that you are there. In the new Jerusalem, when Jesus sees your face, he smiles. He wants you to be there, and he's so happy that you are there. Let's consider for a moment what it would be like to arrive in the new Jerusalem. So that after everything it has taken you to run the race of the Christian life, all of the suffering and prayers, all the evil you endured, everything, you arrive there. And remembering what you've gone through and what Jesus did to get you there, it's all too overwhelming. And the tears well up in your eyes and you begin to cry. But when Jesus sees you, he sees you like the father of the prodigal son. And he runs to meet you. And he throws his arms around you. And then, the hands of God himself will wipe away the last tears that you ever cry. And when we step back and behold our Savior in that moment, it's glorious like nothing we've ever seen before as the tears clear from our eyes. Because the head, once crowned with thorns and shame, is now radiating all the glory of God. The eyes which once wept over the sins of Jerusalem and the death of Lazarus are now glowing with joy like fire. The hands which were once pierced with nails to prepare this place for you are now holding the victor's crown of life for your head. And the mouth which once cried out in agony on the cross now declares with delight, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness. That's what it looks like when John writes, God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. In the new Jerusalem, when we worship Jesus, it's amazing because we don't need a church or a temple because God himself is there with all of his radiant glory. And we don't need lights or the sun because the Lamb Himself will be our light. And we don't need crosses or other symbols to remind us of what Jesus has done, because you can see the nail marks and you can touch His side. 
That's what worship is like in the new Jerusalem. And there is so much we do not know about what that life will be like. But we do know this. Jesus gets the last word about the old order of things. The old order of things has passed away. So that there is no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, no more. And it will be the greatest family reunion in all of history as God's people see each other again. And much like going to a family reunion, where everyone has to pack themselves in the car, and you deal with the different personalities on the road, and the children in the back constantly ask, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? To the point you get sick of it. That's how we go through the Christian life, bearing with one another as we go through the valley of the shadow of death. But finally, on that day, we crest over the hill. Now the answer is, we're here. We're home. And to all the questions we ask, when? The answer is finally, now. And for each of us, that question sounds a little bit different. We think about those who have gone on before us. And we ask in our hearts, when will I see him again? When will I see her smile? For me, the question burning in my heart is, when will God let me hug my mom again? And on that day, on that day, the answer to all of those questions is now and always now. So that if you ask on that day, when am I going to see them again? The answer is they're right over there. You can see them. If you ask, am I ever going to be separated from them again? The answer is, no more. This is a world without death and without mourning. It is also a world without crying or pain. In the new heavens and the new earth, everything just works and feels how it's supposed to. You never wake up and don't want to get out of bed. You never work and feel dissatisfied. You never feel like, ah, I'm not supposed to be here. No, everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be. And that new creation is stunning because the grass is greener than it's ever been before. The sky is bluer like you've never seen. And I'm not just saying that because with a resurrected body, I won't need these anymore. I'm saying that because the new resurrection will be untouched, untainted by sin, so that everything is more real and full of joy like never before. Jesus gets the last word about the new creation. Jesus says, I am making everything new. When was the last time you bought everything new? Not just remodeling a bathroom, not just a new kitchen appliance, everything. You might say, Vicar, that's a silly question. I don't have the money for that. But Jesus makes everything new. It's a new heavens and a new earth where everything is right and it works exactly how it's supposed to. And Jesus gives the invitation to come to this new Jerusalem and it rings out throughout all creation today as Jesus says, To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. Jesus invites all of us who hunger and thirst for righteousness to be filled. And you and I have the privilege of handing out that invitation. Because we all know someone who needs to hear it. Whether it's someone who has never heard the invitation before. Or maybe 
Maybe it's somebody who once heard it. Maybe they even heard the good news in this very building, but not anymore. We can be bold and confident to share this invitation because Jesus told John, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Jesus is speaking as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. When Jesus tells the truth, there's no second guessing. Jesus gets the last word on Judgment Day and the life of the world to come. And in Greek, it is just one word. Gegene, or in English, for those of you who say it's all Greek to me, it is done. It has happened. It is complete. So that as surely as you see me standing in front of you today with your own eyes, someday you will see Jesus come back and do everything he's promised to do with your own eyes. So let's return to where we started with the Apostle John. Now he sits at his desk and his head is lifted up and he's smiling. In his hand, he holds the completed manuscript of the book of Revelation. The author of life has dictated the ending of the story and its victory. The saints will be triumphant. John will see the other apostles again soon. And he rushes to send this letter out to the seven churches. And there's joy and hope in that work. Because John knows. Because we know. Whatever else happens, Jesus gets the last word. And in the name of Jesus, amen. Please stand. May the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We continue with our confession of faith using the words of the Nicene Creed towards the bottom of page 10. We confess. We believe in one God, Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, but one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and he came truly to For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We acknowledge one holy Christian and our solid church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. This morning, in the prayer of the church, we have had prayers requested for Brandon, for Brandon Major, friend of Dave Palsic, as he continues to recover from a recent heart valve replacement. And unrelated to that, he begins testing to determine whether or not he is in the initial stages of ALS. We join together in prayer. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives.
Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Support us for all we spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise, Raise up Christians to serve you in this ministry of the word, and in all God's and of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give us wisdom that we may justice and Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, car commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. We all who devote themselves to this useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Especially, we pray for Brandon Major. Compassionate Father, in your mercy, you transform even sickness and disease into blessing for your children. With confidence, we commit Brandon Major into your tender care. Provide healing and relief according to your infinite wisdom and boundless mercy. Grant patient, patient endurance if suffering must continue. Help him to find true spiritual strength through Jesus and his cross in this time of physical weakness. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant our love, and take and you as Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. We bless you with your faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. Please be seated for the offering. <laughs> Christ our Lord, who promised 
that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them, to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. Amen.
given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Savior Jesus Christ. This is the true body poured out for you, your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of given sins. into death for the Take forgiveness death. of all of your sins. This is the true blood Take of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior Jesus poured out for Christ, you. given into death for the forgiveness, for the forgiveness of, sins. of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Pour out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Pour out for you for the forgiveness of sins. May this strengthen and keep you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen.
poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. May this strengthen and keep you in the true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Continue on page 16 of the liturgy. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we We give thanks, Almighty God that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it, you will strengthen our faith in in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for the closing hymn, hymn 890, Jerusalem the Gold.
Once again, as the vicar stated at the beginning, welcome in the service of praise of the Savior who has made us saints and will judge us according to his grace and his mercy and give us that eternal life, that new Jerusalem. If you uh, participated with us virtually today, if you send me a text message, uh, that information is useful to me. We've got a couple of announcements here. Uh, then we want to recognize our veterans today. So new member directories, uh, hard copies are available on the gray folding table in the narthex. I'll send out a digital copy uh, later today. Next Sunday, uh, Joyce Lehman will be here from Thai Village with its annual craft sale. Uh, those crafts go to support those people in Thailand we're working with. Uh, so uh, remember that as you make plans for next Sunday. Risen Savior in Mansfield is a mission congregation that we are supporting uh, each quarter with our gifts. Uh, they have sent a letter of thanks, a card of thanks, and pictures of what they're doing uh, with that extra amount. Of, that they were not uh, coming on this year, but uh, our, our members have given that, and we are thankful for them as the work that they carry out. Poinsettias are available for purchase. Envelopes are there on the poinsettia sign-up. Uh, the deadline for signing up is the end of this month. And now, as we exercise this week the freedoms that we have as a citizen of the United States of America in the election that we held, we're thankful to all those veterans who spent their time and their efforts in safeguarding those freedoms and defending our country's constitution. And we'd like to recognize you, so please stand. Those of you who are veterans. Thank you for your service to our country. <laughs> Lastly, we want to go through another section of setting two, the new worship, order of worship that we're going to be using at the end of this month. So we're going to start at Gradually <coughs> Hymnal in the Rack. We're starting at page 184. 186. Right. With the Jesus Lamb of God. We just, we've, we've done these before, so we're just going to sing them up. Adult choir members, please gather at the back. 186.
179, we use the words for Advent. Top of page 179. And this one, the choir will be first. Okay. Listen as the choir <laughs> sings it first.